Good afternoon everyone, Zero and Disney here, and of course we're going to be talking about what happened at Extreme Rules in just a few minutes. But before I get started, there's a little bit of, uh, I guess you could call this housekeeping to uh, get to before I go any further. Now, a lot of things have happened in the last couple of days, and some interesting things on a lot of different fronts, like there's wrestling fronts, Disney fronts, even stuff from Universal. So without any further ado, let's get started. So, let's start with some pop news real quick. Hope you guys enjoyed this weekend of Will we just went through, and uh, know that Will will be joining us for a lot more videos in the near future, as well, of course, as Mr. Flashback gracing us with his presence next week with Santa with Muscles. Yes, he got one over on me for not reviewing everything since it's Hulk Hogan movie month. So now he only has to do two instead of doing four. So yeah, Mr. Flashback, you got one over on me. But you still got to do two. And I'm sure that eats you up inside knowing that. So Santa with Muscles is still to come. And if you haven't yet seen it, check out the review of No Holds Barred, Mr. Flashback's debut here on Pop. And that is in the Mr. Flashback playlist right underneath this one. Or you could just use this one if you'd like to get to it. It's in the pop playlist just the same. So uh, hopefully you guys will enjoy that. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the uh, Will tutorial we had about Rocco's Modern Life. And know that there is a Will tutorial plan for next week as well. The Will tutorial will be this time focusing on the Arkham video game series of the Batman franchise. Arkham City, Arkham Asylum, and uh, the upcoming Arkham Origins. I didn't do them in order, but I mean, those are the three games. And uh, there are some new information available right now. Some new information has been released about the uh, voice cast for Arkham Origins. So uh, something that Will did not get to chat about during that video because we shot it the other day. So uh, hopefully he'll bring it up in the uh, next Will tutorial, whatever it may be. So there's that. I don't know why. Whenever I get in front of this camera, for some reason, my nose always starts itching. I just look like a fool just going and scratching my nose. But oh well. Ben will be joining us later in the week with more music reviews. Haven't got anything right now, but uh, I'm sure he's going to be giving us something. And uh, got some AJ updates. Yes, AJ uh, got a hold of me today, and um, he was actually supposed to come over here tonight to um, shoot the second part of the two-part Celebrity Apprentice finale, which was last night. And uh, as you can obviously tell, for good reason, I'm not too happy right now about that. Or about Extreme Rules, but we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. So, uh, because he wasn't able to make it, tomorrow we are doing B-dubs like we usually do after I get off work, and afterwards we're going to come back here and shoot that video, so we'll get that video out to you either Tuesday night or Wednesday morning, one of the two. I'm not sure which. So, got a lot to talk about tonight, and uh, Ben and Will and AJ will all be providing more content for this channel in the near future. AJ has mentioned that he has shown some interest in Flight of the Concords. So AJ is going to be watching the seasons of Flight of the Concords and he's going to be uh, reviewing them. And maybe, just maybe, we might get our first top ten about the songs of Flight of the Concords. Since Brett and Jermaine are now uh, known well for their music. Especially Brett McKenzie who just won a Academy Award. So uh, that was awesome. And now Jermaine Clement can uh, follow in his footsteps maybe one day, so. Or maybe we can get Flight on together on a uh, soundtrack. So that's coming, and that also got me thinking, why not have there be another review this time of Human Giant? So Human Giant will be uh, focused on as well in the near future. And another big, big, big thing from AJ that's coming up for the summer. We like to call this the Summer of... Tarantino. That's right. AJ is going to be reviewing every single Quentin Tarantino film that you've ever heard of, and a few that you did not know were by him. And that is going to be throughout the rest of the summer, through the beginning of the summer, all the way up until the end of August will be Tarantino time here on Pop. So that's going to be awesome. Top 10 still to come, obviously, from all the podcasters, including myself, if I'm able to be able to do it. Obviously, my memory's not the greatest, so I have notes and stuff like that, so. But we'll talk about that later. Celebrity Apprentice we'll talk about tomorrow, so uh, 
If you still have time to go out to uh, your local Walgreens, if it's available in your area, pick up some uh, Magic Squirtle ice cream. It is awesome. At least it looks awesome. And I hope, fingers crossed, that with my mom being in Pittsburgh today for the next few days, she can find a Walgreens somehow, some way that has some Magic Squirtle so I can get my hands on it. And then, of course, I'll wash it out once it's done, and I'll put it on my uh, mantle, most likely. That's pretty much a guarantee. So... There's always that. And uh, that's still to come later this week. We have different stuff. Obviously, we are going to be uh, doing AJ's movie reviews this week. That, uh, yeah. Due to circumstances beyond my control, I will have to be going to the Todd Phillips movie. And, uh, you know, it's all about you guys. It's all about this channel and getting a review out for this channel. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to force myself to sit through uh, that thing again. As well as Epic and Fast 6, which both look awesome, so I'm looking forward to those. But obviously the other one... Uh, I actually might be building it tomorrow. It depends on if it gets there in time or not. So I might be building that movie tomorrow. Who knows? Excuse me. It's about 80 degrees outside right now. It's awesome outside. Okay. So, you didn't hear, come here to hear me rant and rave. Well, maybe some of you did. AJ, turn off your television. And basically, uh... My hair up that way. So, um, we'll talk about the uh, travesty that happened on Celebrity Apprentice last night and uh, their review tomorrow. So, uh, you'll get that either Tuesday or Wednesday. I haven't quite decided yet. Just depends on when I can shoot it out. Um, Will will not be joining me tonight, at least as of almost 5 o'clock. So, he's got three hours to let me know if he's going to be here for Raw or not. So, Will will not be joining me for this. So, after Raw is over tonight, I'm going to shoot you guys the Raw recap video like we've been doing lately, and that way we're going to have it up most likely before tomorrow because I have to work in the morning. So, I want to get the video out before I leave for the day because I don't come straight home after work. Obviously, everyone knows I go to beat up, so uh, I don't want to come home late and get you a video out at 10 p.m. if I don't have to. So, if I have to, I will, but other things that were announced... It's been officially announced May 23rd is going to be the official date for DVC members to be able to buy into the villas at the Grand Floridian. And oh my god, I'm so excited because that means that this year, December 4th, Suro and Disney very well, very possibly, might be staying at the Grand Floridian. That's right, it all started back for the first episode of Full House. I remember walking down that iconic staircase, the same place that Jesse Wood was playing the grand piano for Rebecca, and it was awesome, and I've walked down that same staircase before, and it was incredible, and I've always said that I want to stay at the, the deluxe resort before my uh, time is done on this earth, so uh, basically... Uh, I conquered the poly last year, and for the first day of reunion this year is going to be either Grand Floridian or Bay Lake Tower. I'm on a wait list for Bay Lake Tower right now, but I'll cancel that wait list if I can stay at the Grand Floridian. But I won't find that information out until uh, about August 4th, so right before I go home for the first time this year, I'll know what's going on in December, so who knows what's going to happen. They've got these things that are one-time use points that are $15 a shot. And that way I don't have to dip into my uh, points for next year because I'm banking my points for next year. going to pay out of pocket for both trips next year. That way I can have all my points for the next two years and I can use them on the big trip. 2015 is going to be Walt Disney World and then flying to California, going to Disneyland and California Adventure as well as stops at both Universal's on each coast, Universal Studios Florida and Islands of Adventure, as well as Universal Studios Hollywood. So that's going to be awesome. But that's all that I want to uh, talk about before we get started. And uh, let's uh, get into Extreme Rules, which I just watched today. And uh, I will be very thankful that there was a Put Locker because it was very easy to watch this. If you guys uh, are watching anything on uh, LetMeWatchThis.ch, which I definitely recommend, as long as the website's up, it's phenomenal. Go for Sock Share or Put Locker. They're very, very useful. They're not easy to find as much as they used to be, but they're very useful. So uh, check those out if you uh, go to that site. We start off the show with the uh, first match of the evening was Fondango taking on Y2J Chris Jericho. Of course, Fondango accompanied by the very beautiful Summer Rae sporting a very... Very nice looking dress. She looked awesome tonight. 
So, of course, as you know, this is how it works on Pop. We go through the midway through the match, and we go all the way to the finish, and that's what we're going to do. So Jericho crowns him off the top rope, nails the bulldog, goes to the walls of Jericho, and then there's the top rope. He climbs to it, goes for the flying body press. Fondango rolls through, goes for the guillotine leg drop off... Wow, long day. Guillotine leg drop off the top, and uh, Jericho out of the way. Nails the lion salt. Fondango kicks out. Now, later on in the match, uh, Jericho ends up getting nailed with a sunset flip out of a tip-up from Fondango. Reversed into the walls, but this time Fondango makes it to the ropes. He jumps off the top rope, catches the code breaker, and one, two, three. So the match ends with Jericho winning clean. No interference from Summer Rae. As a matter of fact, all she did at ringside was just pound the mat. I've done that before. But at least I had some vocal ability when it comes to that. So, um, yeah, I was wrong on that match. And I think Will was right. I don't have our, our predictions in front of me, but I know I was wrong. So I thought Fondango would go over. But, I mean, there was a point that was made on a website today that I saw, and I totally understand why they're saying this. Fondango lost because they're trying to put him on the back burner, and with what happened tonight with another singles championship, you don't really have much you can do, given the fact that the Intercontinental Champion is a heel. So, you're not going to turn him babyface, at least not now. So, basically, he's on the back burner for the time being. So, Jericho had to go over, save some face, and I think either at payback... Or, if they go all the way to SummerSlam, we are going to see Fondango win this feud. And then Jericho, of course, will go away and go with his uh, his band and tour with Fozzie for a while. So, Because Fondango is going to be on television and uh, Jericho is not. But I'll tell you right now, the match was a lot better than the one at WrestleMania. Definitely not the botchiest match like the finish was at WrestleMania. But it was fine. It was okay for what it was. It wasn't the greatest match. It wasn't the worst either. So it was an okay way to start off the show. The live show, actually. So we go back to Josh Matthews. He's got Sheamus. And basically, Sheamus, uh, the point of this promo, he's confident about what's going to happen. Okay. So the next match is a match I've been definitely looking forward to since I heard about it announced on television. The United States champion, Kofi Kingston, defending against Dean Ambrose of The Shield. And this match was awesome. So before the match starts... um. Roman Reigns and Seth Rollins, they don't come down with Ambrose, so Ambrose is going to do this on his own, which is awesome, which basically proves that he doesn't need to have interference to win his matches. So that makes him an even better singles competitor. So, basically, Kofi goes for his leaping clothesline, gets reversed into a Bob Backlund-style cross-faced chicken wing, and Kofi ducks down, sends Ambrose headfirst into the top turnbuckle, and that breaks it. We see the leaping clothesline, goes for the boom drop, nails it, and kick out. Eventually, Kofi goes back and forth with Ambrose and nails SOS. Still gets only an ear fall. And the superplex attempt is blocked. He knocks him off. And Ambrose locks on a butterfly superplex, which looked absolutely brilliant, by the way, for only a near fall. Kofi comes off with a springboard crossbody, only gets the two count. And then backdrop to the apron, and Ambrose struggles to get to his feet, gets nailed with trouble in paradise, knocked off the apron to the arena floor. Obviously, Kofi can't pin him on the outside, so he goes back in and drags the dead weight back from the ring and still only gets a two count. So, stacked roll up from Dean Ambrose, still only gets a two count. Trouble in paradise, this time missed, he hits the top rope, nails the bulldog driver, which, I mean, you can call anything you want. I mean, it could be a dangerous bulldog. It could be a bulldog driver. It actually could be a, a side headlock front rush and leg sweep. You can call it that. Anyway, it looks devastating and evil. So, Dean Ambrose wins the United States Championship clean in a really awesome match. And after the match, Rollins and Reigns come out for the Shield celebration. And I did say, and I do remember this, that... May 19th was the night of the Shield, and uh, we'll find out in a couple segments if I am correct or not. So we had a strap match up next, uh, kind of uneventful to be totally honest. So basically there were green for Sheamus, haha, -ha, and red for Mark Henry again, haha, -ha, right next to each ring post, basically tied to the ring post, and whenever you hit the top turnbuckle, the light would light up. And obviously, once someone broke the momentum and touched the other competitor, that meant that the light would go off. So pretty much everything would be for nothing. 
So at one point, Seamus actually got to three while being on the ring apron, which was not allowing Mark Henry any striking distance, which actually worked really well. But he got caught when he basically Vader rammed him into him. So both men started touching the corners at the same time. Mark Henry headbutted Seamus and broke that one. Sheamus ended up getting a three, but he got double-legged and spine-bustered from Mark Henry. That broke that one. Sheamus got three. Goes for the world's strongest slam, does Mark Henry. He picks him up. He lands on his feet, backs up, nails the broad kick, and gets the fourth. So Sheamus wins clean, and uh, he is on a collision course with the World Heavyweight Championship, currently held by Dolph Ziggler. So there was numerous people on this show tonight that have a stake of a claim for a title shot against Ziggler down in the road. I hope this means that Mark Henry will be taken off SmackDown, put on Raw, and sicked on Cena. That's what I really want to see, because I think that's a good idea and that's the right direction to go with. But, unfortunately, maybe they don't agree with me and Sheamus went over, and this match was not very good at all. It wasn't even really that brutal. We go backstage and we see a promo with AJ sporting her brand new shirt, which you can pick up on uh, Shop, of course. Which actually is something that, you know, honestly, it almost looks kind of uh, like something I might wear. And it's a very much a truth. Love does bite. No lie. But uh, AJ sports it, and AJ makes it look so good, obviously. And uh, as she always does. And she's uh, fighting with Caitlyn and basically asking about her secret admirer. And then they just go back and forth. A lot of jaw jacking, a lot of cat calling. And then eventually they start cat fighting at the feet of Tamina Snuka and the Bella Twins, which are there for no apparent reason, really. And, of course, this is going to build up to the match that I've been talking about for almost a month now, where you're going to see Caitlyn put the Divas Championship on the line against AJ Lee, most likely tonight on Raw, so that's what I'm thinking they're going to go with. We've got an I Quit match, and, you know, again, not the greatest of matches. I'll say that right now. It was Alberto Del Rio taking on the Dark Patriot, Jack Swagger, of course, with Zeb Coulter in his corner, and ADR, of course, had Ricardo Rodriguez in his corner. So, during the match, at different points in the beginning of the match, you basically had both the leg and the arm attack. So both Del Rio and Swagger went, uh, went after each other's body parts to set up their finish, which works. So, we saw the normal duck the clothesline, and this time, in not Orton style, tilt a whirl, and then the grounded sidekick to the side of the head. And nine shots with a Singapore cane while Swagger was tied up in the ropes. And he was going for the backstabber. And in Sandman fashion, he grabs the Singapore cane, wraps it around the chest, and lands the backstabber. So it looked pretty good, actually. I enjoyed it. And uh, Swagger bomb eventually to the back of ADR because he got knocked down. Nailed the gut wrench power bomb not once, but twice. And this time went for the cross arm breaker, but it was reversed into the Patriot lock. And he even grapevines the legs in very Kurt Angle fashion. So this is awesome. I love this finish. We haven't used this finish in quite a long time. Of course, this takes you back, considering the fact that we used the crossface chicken wing early on with Dean Ambrose and Kofi Kingston. This harkens back to, I believe, Survivor Series 1997. Six? Yes, 96. 97 was the, the year that all hell broke loose in Montreal. Survivor Series 96, it was Mr. Bob Backlund against Bret the Hitman Hart, and Owen Hart was in the corner of Bret Hart and uh, actually threw the towel in for his brother, so Backlund won the match. Well, it's funny because Ricardo came out with a towel, and Del Rio was in trouble, he was locked in the leg grapevine on the ankle lock, so Ricardo was like, I'm gonna throw it in, I'm gonna throw it in, he's like, no, Ricardo, don't throw it in, so Zeb pie faces him, takes the towel and tosses it in. So the referee sees that the towel's tossed in and rings the bell. Now, there's a lot of people in the crowd that looked really confused why the bell rang. Obviously, they weren't clued in on the fact that the towel being thrown in actually is the end of the match. So they had Jack Swagger win. They started his music and everything. The fans booed like they're supposed to, and everything was all great. But it was not to be because we did a dusty finish here at Extreme Rules, folks. Yes, we did. Because another referee came out to the ring and said, no, no, no. It wasn't him that threw it in. Zeb Coulter threw the towel in, so you need to re rethink your decision here. And he's like, hold on, hold on. Mike Kyoto's like, okay, let's start this match again, maybe. How about I just give me a replay? So he goes outside to the cameraman, who has a flat screen, mind you, for I don't know why, and he shows him the replay of, yes, Zeb Coulter did throw the towel in. So he's like, well, if Del Rio could still continue, then we're going to restart this match. Of course, Del Rio could continue. They did restart the match. 
and he went for the cross arm breaker. Swagger reversed it, stacked him up momentarily, but he was still locked in the cross arm breaker. He rolled back into it, and Swagger did say I quit, so that was the match. Uh, anticlimactic, to say the least, so uh, it was all right. Ryback's doing a promo, and of course it looks like he's staring cue cards. No offense to Ryback, but he is uh, not the most unrobotic person when it comes to cutting promos. And it's funny, because Cena was the prototype, and he, his gimmick literally was... 50 man, 50% 50 man, and 50% machine. I mean, it, come on, it made sense. Right back against the prototype. But of course, we're not going that way. So, basically, that's we just got the gist of it. Right back rules. Or, right back rules. <sighs> He's the master and the ruler of the world. <sighs> anyway, all Sid and Goldberg connections, and Ultimate Warrior for that matter, connections aside... It was alright. It was okay. Next match, Tornado Tag Team Title Match. The Shield taking on the current WWE Tag Team Champions. Kane and Daniel Bryan, hell no. So, during this match, right pretty much at the beginning, they went for um, the Super Bomb. Yeah, the Pitbulls, a power bomb off the top rope, the Super Bomb. And Bryan reverses into Hurricane Rana. Kane grabs both Rollins and Reigns and throws them over the top rope, and Danielson nails the suicide dive. So, Kane hooks up the sidewalk slam, and Brian comes off the ropes with a hooking clothesline the second he connects. It was a great double team, by the way. Where was this back in the day? So, Kane hit the flying clothesline off the top rope, and then the swan dive headbutt, or the flying goat, if you want to call it that, and Rollins ended up making the save on Reigns. There's a no-lock on Reigns, and Kane distracts Rollins momentarily. Rollins gets the upper hand and then charges in to break that up. So there's a spear and a pinfall attempt on Kane. Brian ends up making the save this time. So there's a roll-up, locked in the no-lock, reversed, catapult slingshot style. Daniel Bryan into Rollins, who kicks him in the head, comes off, this is an awesome finish, by the way. So Reigns picks up Daniel Bryan in a torture rack. And Rollins comes to the top rope, climbs off, dives off, nails the knee drop right to the chest as he's dropping. So it was like a doomsday knee drop, and it was incredible. And that was all, folks. That was the end of it right there. New WWE Tag Team Champions, The Shield. And, uh, of course, Ambrose comes in with the United States Championship to... Celebrate, and yes, May 19th was definitely the Night of the Shield, just like I said it was going to be. Now, it's funny because if you think about it from this perspective, Kane is another reason not to like May 19th. Not just see no evil, but the fact that they lost the uh, WWE Tag Team Championships on May 19th, so uh, there was always that. So, of course, during the pre-show, we saw Miz taking on Cody Rhodes, Mustachio himself, and basically... Cody ends up going off the top rope, gets locked in the figure four, and T-taps. Yeah, sad panda. So up next, we saw a... Well, I like The Miz, obviously. It's just, stop using the figure four. It sucks, because in this show, both Triple H and The Miz used the figure four, and they both attributed their using of the figure four to Ric Flair. So I really hated the fact that they used both of them. I mean, it makes no sense on both. I mean, it really doesn't make any sense with The Miz, even though that's trying to push the storyline. Triple H and Ric Flair makes total sense, obviously, because of evolution. But that's another story altogether. We'll also talk about evolution later, maybe. Had our Extreme Rules match, which was anything but. And it was very tame for Extreme Rules match. I mean, chairs, ladders, and Singapore canes were used. So, yeah, that was it. So, basically, the big show does an old backyard wrestling tactic that I have done before. I like to call it setting up my own demise. And put a chair, put two chairs stacked up, and there was a ladder between them. So, it was a side slam. He places them on top of the ladder. He climbs up the middle turnbuckle for, like, the Vader bomb. You know, he dives off and he hits the elbow. Well, Orton's out of the way, and he elbow drops the ladder. And of course, that hurts. And... Basically, we go midway through the match. Ord ends up hitting the snake bite DDT off the top rope. Then the RKO, one, two, Big Show kicks out to uh, the chagrin of the hometown crowd of Orton. Obviously, we're in St. Louis tonight. So, chair is grabbed, chair to the ribs, chair shot. This time it's reversed when he dives in for a chair shot. 
He rushes in with the chair. He gets harpooned. And eventually, there's an RKO right on top of the steel chair. Orton doesn't know how to finish him off because obviously the RKO is not working. So we get the concussion kick. Punts him right in the top of the head. And the crowd goes crazy for it. One, two, three. Big Show is defeated. Yeah. Not a good match. I don't want to see these guys ever again. If Big Show and Randy Orton wrestle again in the near future, I'm going to lose my mind. I don't want to see these guys ever wrestle again. I heard the rumors. I think you just do that. I mean, put Randy Orton in the ring with Brock Lesnar. Do that. Get the Big Show. Do something else with him. Put him on Raw if you want to do him that, that way. But, I mean, I'm done with this. Big Show and Sheamus, I guess you want to go there. Whatever. I don't... I'm not too big of both of their styles anymore. So, there's always that. We got to our main event. Well, it should have been the main event. It was for the WWE Championship, but it wasn't the main event because it wasn't Triple H versus Brock Lesnar. We had a last man standing match. So, early on in the match, Cena goes for the AA, gets reversed, and Ryback picks him up and hits the backpack stunner, which was Skip Sheffield's old finisher, which made me really excited. He grabs a table from underneath the ring, sets the table up in the corner, and a really awesome spot that I very much enjoyed, he fall away slam Cena through the table laying in the ring. In the ring, wow. Against the uh, ring. Wow, against the turnbuckles. That's the word I'm trying to look for. Sorry, long day. Only got up about eight. So, proto bomb, five knuckle shuffle, and an AA, and Ryback's up at eight. So, Cena with a nice power bomb, and Ryback again gets up at eight. So,. Basically, Cena goes for the Rana, and he doesn't really connect. He pretty much, like, jumps onto Ryback's chest instead of his neck. So, they fight for a little bit. It looked like they were literally uh, really angry at each other for this one. The body scissors is what pretty much it was. And he basically just releases it and bombs him, so that was it. So, they picked up the match after that. Ryback hits the meat hook, and again, Super Cena up at 8. So, it goes for the STF, and basically choking him out, and Ryback gets up at 9. So, it's, they set another table up, as Ryback grabs Cena's head and throws him head first into the canvas. So, uh, I'll use an old Tony Schiavone line, that's etc. in headache number 9 right there. So, um, well, maybe Bobby Heenan said it. It was one of the two, it was on WCW Worldwide. It was, uh, it's actually talked about in Foley's first book. So, uh, yeah, if you haven't read it ever read Mick Foley's first book, Have a Nice Day, then uh, you probably wouldn't know what I'm talking about, but uh, that's pretty much what happened. So, basically, on that, he goes for the shell shock again. He does his stupid stomp around like he always does. He gets AA'd through the table. So that works really well. We have a nice double down, and he, uh, both men get up at nine. So another shell shock, Cena gets up at nine again. So... We basically go out to the ring. Cena spears right back through the outside barricade, pretty much in the uh, little uh, corral where the uh, ring for the timekeeper is. And that's pretty much that for that. Both another double down, and they fight through the crowd at one point. Ryback picks up a piece of the wall. like I, They look like boards like at a hockey game. I think that's the best way I can describe them. Pulls it off and nails Cena with it. And, of course, Cena gets up again at 9. So Cena's sleeper hold grabs him on the back of Ryback. He puts him down, still up at 9. And he puts him on a table and splashes him off the railing, which, very ECW style tonight, still get up at 8. Cena grabs the fire extinguisher and shoots a bunch of CO2 in uh, Ryback's face, like, numerous times, ineffectively blind him, blinding him. So, he picks up the fire extinguisher and he nails him in the head, or at least that's what they were going for, but camera angles are not good sometimes. And he gets up at 7 after the two shots with there. AA's reversed. He double legs him, picks him up, and rams him through the set, through the LED lights, and presumably to the concrete outside. Obviously, that's where you want to think. And we go back to the camera, and Charles Robinson runs off, finds him in the back, and says... We need some help, because obviously both Cena and Ryback are sprawled out on the ground. We see Ryback basically get struggled to his feet by a couple officials, and Cena's laying unconscious. He is uh, stretchered out. And of course, they completely ruined this, because during the uh, post-show, we saw Cena get off the stretcher, take the noose, what, what is it, the halo? I don't remember what it is, the protective like 
neck gimmick. I don't know what you would call it. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, that's it. The protective headgear that for good for people that just stabilize their neck. Basically, um, he takes that off and he just like speeds away. So I mean, that's the end of that. So yeah, yeah, this is a doozy of pay per view, folks. It really was. We're only 30 minutes in. I just want to get this over with because I just didn't like this pay per view. But we'll talk about that in a minute. So we get our main event and a brand new style cage, as predicted on Twitter, as Brock Lesnar with Paul Heyman, of course, taking on the game, Triple H. And this was in the new style steel cage. So we had a spine buster. Triple H literally with the hair, obviously. It really was the double R spine buster this time around. It was awesome. So he goes for the pedigree. He gets backdropped into the side of the steel cage. Lesnar hits the German suplex, picks him up an over-the-shoulder power slam into the steel cage. And he hits another over-the-shoulder power slam. So, during this, Lesnar goes to a nail Triple H while he's laying on the cage with a knee strike. While Triple H moves out of the way, Lesnar leaps in the air and catches the patella right against the side of the cage. And he's done for the rest of the match. From this moment forward, Brock Lesnar sells the knee. Just sells the knee. I don't think he has a reason to not sell the knee because, obviously, I think it was legitimate. Because it very much felt very well seems like it could have been. So basically, there's a chin breaker. Goes to the pedigree again. This time, still reverse. The Kimura is applied, and Triple H breaks it with punches to the kneecap, of course, which has worked on the whole match. And there's a clothesline. Lesnar is trying to get to the door, and he has to limp because of his knee. Triple H clips the knee from behind, and basically, Triple H tries to exit the cage. Paul Heyman slams the door into his face, thus also knocking Charles Robinson on the floor because he was hanging on to the cage and he got sent for the ride when he uh, swung the cage door. F5 picked up very gingerly, obviously, working the knee, and near fall, Heyman slides in a steel chair, again knocking down Ro Charles Robinson, who was trying to uh, get him from not interfering, locks the door, and so the beating shall begin. So Lesnar says, my knee is bad. Heyman says, walk it off. So, shake it off now. I mean, this is important. You obviously have to win this match. So, don't worry about your knee. Worry about taking out Triple H. Okay. So, Trip goes for the F5 again. His knee buckles out for the way to Triple H. And, basically, after that, the chair is used to the ribs and in the back and then to the back of the knee by Triple H. The chair is also hit to the knee once again and two elbow strikes to the knee... This time, Lesnar locks on the Kimura one more time, and it's broken by Triple H working on the leg yet again. Locks on the figure four, and he's adding more insult to injury by punching the kneecap while he's got it locked on. So Lesnar ends up reversing it, and the hold is broken, finally. So, basically... I'm looking forward to this here. I'm trying to read here. There you go. So Brock Lesnar tries to climb out of the cage. Triple H, right as he's about to climb over, Triple H takes a chair and wham! Nails him in the kneecap with it. And of course, he, he's done because of course his knee has been worth the entire match. Well, um, slams his face into the cage two times and Triple H grabs a sledgehammer which was camouflaged on top of the cell. Or the cage in this case. It was hidden from everyone's view. Lesnar pulls him off as a last ditch effort and... Grabs the sledgehammer, is going to finish off Triple H. Triple H ducks the shot, locks on a sharpshooter of all things, which is very strange. Heyman runs into the ring and eats the pedigree, basically allowing Lesnar to counter. And he gets tries to counter, but he gets caught. He gets kicked, he gets pedigreed, and he kicks out. So Heyman ends up low-blowing Triple H before he could nail Brock with the sledgehammer. And after that... Lesnar grabs a sledgehammer and cracks Triple H right in the jaw with it, knocking him out, picks him up, F5, and 1, 2, 3. And after the match is over, he grabbed the sledgehammer, put it on Triple H's chest, and crossed his arms across Triple H's body. Hmm. He crossed his arms across Triple H. Are we foreshadowing, possibly, for The Undertaker at WrestleMania 30? We'll see. And Jerry Lawler had an awesome... Uh, line to end this. He basically said if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. So, that's always that. Extreme Rules, eh. I'm going to quote Todd in the Shadows. Eh. Just, no. Didn't really work for me. Um, 
Payback. Let's look at that right now. Payback's pretty much set up this way. I don't know if we'll go with Jericho and Fandango 3 at Payback, or we'll go all the way to SummerSlam, but either way, Fandango will win the rubber match. The Shield cannot lose championships ever. Like, ever. I mean, it's they're going to ha all have to have a long, long reign. The Miz winning against Cody Rhodes tonight pretty much puts him into contendership for Wade Barrett's Intercontinental title. I don't have a problem with that. Sheamus winning tonight puts him in contendership for Dolph Ziggler's World Heavyweight Championship, as well as Alberto Del Rio winning, which made him the legitimate number one contender for Ziggler's title. Mark Henry lost, but he still looks kind of strong because he wasn't pinned, obviously, because it was a strap match. And Swagger tapped out. He actually said, I quit, so... Uh, don't know what's going to be repercussions from Zeb Coulter on Raw tonight. Well, guess we'll find out sooner rather than later. So, uh, the Shield are dominant. Great match against Hell No. And uh, Randy Orton and the Big Show just plotted through another match that really wasn't extreme at all. John Cena and Ryback's non-finish really uh, kind of set me off a little bit. I didn't really like how it was done. And uh, the cage match was brutal and, and good for what it was. I very much enjoyed Brock and Triple H this time around. It was actually better than most of their encounters so far. I think it's the best of their three encounters. Without question. So, yeah, that's that's Extreme Rules. Yeah, that's it. I don't really have anything more I want to say. So, uh, in conclusion, if you like these videos, thumbs them up. Do leave a comment. Do subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Tell your friends to do the same. Subscribe and to view this wonderful channel here that we like to call Pop. If you want to follow me on Twitter, you're more than welcome to, at Sir Owen Disney. Or if you want to help Become part of the Popcaster Revolution. Send your memes, send your videos, send whatever you want, within question, obviously, to SurrowandDisney at gmail.com. And if you want to be a part of Pop, we'll make you a Popcaster, and we'll give you credit for it and let you be seen by hundreds and thousands of people every single week here on this channel. So if you want to broadcast your rants, raves, and reviews, Get at me on Twitter, and I will hopefully help you out with that. So, uh, I'm going to get off here. We're going to be talking about Raw later tonight, and that's in about three hours. Less than three hours now, so it's after five o'clock. So, I'm going to get off here. Hopefully, you guys enjoyed Extreme Rules more than I did, and hopefully, Payback's better. Obviously, I'm more looking forward to Slammiversary on June 2nd, but that's because, obviously, I'm a TNA guy. So, until tomorrow, boys and girls... That's all I gotta say about that.